Amen. Thank you, Shannon. When I saw that Shannon was picking me up at the airport, I thought it was going to be a girl. <laughs> and I was about to call the pastor and said, I, I need a man to pick me up. And I'm glad that man is a man. Amen. He can, he's a man of God. Didn't he do a great job? And didn't they do a great job? Let's thank the Lord for them. Amen. I feel so convicted to do this, I'm going to do it. I really appreciate the students who have come tonight. I know that many of you have had to go home. I get that. Uh, it's a Wednesday night, school tomorrow. So I'm going to be bold, I'm going to be brief, and I'm going to be gone. I'm going to get up, speak up, and shut up. But I want to say to you, it was when I was your age that I messed up. I was in the 10th grade, and I really believe, Pastor, if somebody had taken me in, Brother Mark, and discipled me, I wanted to do right. My parents were hard workers, but they weren't the strongest Christians. I wanted to do right. But in the 10th grade, playing football, I went out one night with a couple of guys older than me. And I'll just go on and say it if you don't mind. I opened a can of beer. Just one little can of beer. And it was Pandora's box for me. And that started about four or five years of regrets. And it was not until I was playing football in college that I started going to the Fellowship of Christian Athlete meetings. And I came to the point in my life where the Lord just pinned me down when I was your age, some of you, I was 18. I was early in high school, I was 14 when I was in the 10th grade. I don't even know if they'll let you do that anymore. In Tennessee, you can get away with anything with education, but anyway. <laughs> but I just messed up. And the Lord uh, pinned me down. And I started just one night after I had been to a party and I woke up the next day and I looked around the room. I hope I'm not saying anything I shouldn't. I hope I'm not hurting your feelings. And the Lord, as I looked around the room where the party had been, the Lord said, is this what you want? And I can remember 5.30 in the morning. I said, no, this is not, I don't want to live like this. And I heard the Lord say in my heart, and he say, people say, God doesn't talk. It wasn't the devil. And it wasn't me. I felt like the Lord said, follow me. And I went back to my little school where I was playing at UT Martin. And I went to a country church that week. 50 farmers and their wives. And Brother Bill, whose son played pro football, gave the altar call and I went forward. 18 years old. February 1976. I'm 62. You don't have to do the math. I'm 62. <laughs> and he said, Steve, what, what do you want? And my buddies in the FCA were back there. They were living for the Lord. They were good athletes, but they were really living for the Lord. I said... I want what they have. He said, they have Jesus. I said, then I want Jesus. And I'm going to find out if I got saved when I was seven or when I was 18. I'm saved now. Don't worry. I'm saved now. All right? <laughs> but I want to say this to you. If I had had somebody 
to pour into my life when I was your age, I wouldn't have messed up. So I want to challenge you. There's a lot of potential that sits right over here. A lot of potential. Why don't some of you disciple them? That's not really the sermon, but I, I've, I've felt that burning in my heart to say. I know some of them had to go. I get it. I've got four grown children. I've got 15 grandbabies. And I pray for them every day because the world in which we live is so sinful. It's going to be really hard to live for the Lord. And I think about how one little stupid decision changed my life and most of the regrets I have in my life were in that little time but aren't you glad that Jesus is Lord that's what I want to talk to you about everybody stand up if you got your Bibles turn with me to Philippians 2 verses 5 through 11 don't you love the music we've had tonight well I hope you like Philippians 2 5 through 11 because it was a first century hymn about Christ. It is, to, in my opinion, the greatest statement about the Lordship of Jesus Christ in the Bible. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, literally selfishly held on to. But he emptied himself. Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself. He emptied himself. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, for this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him not a name, but the name, which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will what? Say it out loud. Bow. Bow. Of those who are in heaven and on the earth and under the earth. That's pretty much everybody. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is what? Say it out loud. To the glory of God the Father. Father, we praise you and worship you that Jesus Christ is Lord. Whether we believe it, whether anybody believes it, Jesus is Lord. Whether this world receives it, Jesus is Lord. And we thank you in Jesus' name. And if you agree with that, say amen. amen. Be seated, please. The early church was a, soon it was a persecuted church. Jesus gave his people power. The difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's a lot of differences, but the primary difference is God was not just with you, God now is in you. How many of you know that in you is better than with you when it comes to God? Amen? Amen. The Holy Ghost of God came to live within the people of God. The temple of God became the people of God. God no longer was dwelling in buildings. God dwells in redeemed humanity. And our physical bodies are the temple of the living God. And it really makes what Mac was talking about even more powerful because, you know what, we have this treasure within our earthen vessels. We are literally the inhabitants. What, who is in us? Christ in us. The hope of glory. How can we, how can we not share the gospel with Jesus in us through the person of the Holy Spirit? And so soon the Christians were rubbing some of their Jewish brethren the wrong way. And the, the Jews started persecuting the Christians and a man named Stephen who really got in their crawl, they stoned him to death. The first martyr of Christianity was a deacon named Stephen killed by Jews who rejected Jesus and rejected his servants. 
It wasn't long. That it wasn't just the Jews that were persecuting Christians. It was the Romans. The Romans at first thought these Christians, they're just like the Jews, but they found out they weren't. That they were even more adamant about their faith in the sense that they could not obey the Roman rule. You could have any religion you want to as long as you keep it to yourself. As long as you don't proselyte. As long as you don't try to win other people to your way of thinking. Just respect everybody. Does that sound familiar to you? Are we not living in a Roman day? I just read a book called The Ten Caesars, and I'm telling you, the ten most important Caesars, Mac talked about one of them a while ago. They were so perverted. They were so ungodly. And yet, Christianity flourished in their midst because there was one thing that the Christians would not in any way waver on. There were many things, but one thing especially, and that was this. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus is Lord. He's not just some little religious person. No, he is King of kings and he is Lord of lords. He's greater than any emperor. He's greater than any ethnarch. He's greater than any person out here. Jesus Christ is Lord. So, many of them didn't serve in the Roman army because to serve in the Roman army, you had to bow down to an idol. And they said, we're not going to do it. And Christianity started to be persecuted. I mean really persecuted. I'm talking about people losing their lives. I'm talking about people losing their properties, people being imprisoned. It was terrible. And one of the things they, they put in, the emperors put into the Roman Empire, and about the time that John was writing the book of Revelation, I just started preaching through the book of Revelation at Bellevue at last Sunday morning, and, and about the time John was writing that was the zenith of the power of the Roman Empire, and they were wanting to make sure that all of the Roman citizens, they had come from so many different backgrounds and so many myth, different ethnic groups, they, they said, you know, we've got to somehow you know, bring everybody in and, and make sure that everybody is patriotic to Rome. And so they said, here it is, emperor worship. We're going to make sure that they don't just worship their gods, but that they worship the God of the Roman Empire. And how better to do that than to worship the emperor himself? So here's what we'll do. We will get a bust, a a, a, a making, a model of whatever Caesar it is, and we'll go from town to town, and we will say, you can worship Jesus, you can worship, you know, the God of Judaism, you can worship whatever you want to worship, as long as simultaneously you bow down to Caesar and say these words, as you burn incense before this bust, this, this, uh, this model of him, all you have to do is say, Caesar Curios, Caesar is Lord. That's all you got to do is burn a little incense and say, Caesar Curios, we'll leave you alone. But the Christians could not say, Caesar Curios, because Jesus. Christos, Kurios, <laughs> Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord willing, I'll be in Israel a week from today. You say, I wouldn't want to go over there right now. But you know what? I feel safer there than I do any place in the world. If something bad's going to happen, I'd rather it happen there than anywhere. Amen? And one of the things I like about it is I'm going to go to an amphitheater where my son really had a changing, life-changing moment. It was an arena in Bet Shan where Christians had been martyred for their faith. 
And my son got right with God in the 11th grade there. He's preaching the gospel now in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. But he got right with God at a place where Christians shed their blood because they could not refuse to say, Jesus is Lord, Caesar is not. I want to ask you, are you going to bow to this world or will you bow to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? What did Paul say to the Philippians? Do you remember when he went to Philippi? It was the first place he witnessed in what we would call Europe. He had had that Macedonian call. He was there at Troas. The Holy Ghost would not let him go up toward the north east. He would not let him go down toward the southwest and he just sits there. You know, when you don't know what to do, don't keep doing something. Just stop and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? That's a great idea, right? And so he prays and he has this vision and he sees this man from Macedonia come over and help us. So he said, we perceive that God was leading us to go there. So they got in a the boat. They went up to the, the area. They went all the way up into Philippi and they found a lady and a bunch of folks out there by a little stream. I've been to that stream and they shared the gospel with them and God opened up Lydia's heart and she received Jesus and said, hey, I've got a nice house over. She was a wealthy woman. Come on over to my house. That'll be your church. And so they started church. They started winning people to the Lord. They led this lady to the Lord. I hear these people say, well, our churches need to be, everybody needs to be alike. Well, don't tell the Philippians that because they had a wealthy woman. And the next person we see getting led to the Lord Jesus was a slave woman who was doing all of this enchanting stuff. She was reading horoscopes and everything else, telling people their future and everything. And Paul got sick of her talking while he was preaching. (laughs) And he said, in the name of Jesus, come out of her. And it did. The demon came out. And the guys lost. You know what happened. They beat Paul. They put Silas in there. And they're praising God at midnight. Sounds like a country music song, doesn't it? I'm telling you. Praising God at midnight, and all of a sudden, the, the earth earthquake, chains fall off, everything, doors fly open, jailer's about to kill himself. Paul said, hey, don't bother yourself. We're all here. Falls at his feet. What do I do to get saved? Obviously, Paul had been singing about the salvation of Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And he shares the gospel. The whole family gets saved. They get baptized. And that's how the church at Philippi starts. And so when Paul comes around and he looks at them, he said, hey, y'all remember how hard it was when we were there at Philippi? Do you remember how hard it was? The Jews ran us off. But listen to me. Have this attitude, this mindset in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. And he just goes off on the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And what he's saying is this, it doesn't matter how hard it is on this earth. The bottom line is, keep it in perspective, guys. Jesus is Lord. So let me give you four things and I'll be done. Number one, Paul said, Jesus was Lord before he ever came to this earth. Look at verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He said Jesus existed in the form of God before he came to this earth. Jesus was Lord before he ever came to this earth. You say, now wait a minute, preacher. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. I got news for you. Jesus was being praised by all the angels and the angelic beings. Way before he ever showed up in Bethlehem, the angels were praising Jesus in eternity past. How does John begin the prologue of his gospel? In the beginning was the Word, Lagos, Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Let's put Jesus' name there. He's talking about Jesus. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. Now look at me. Bad, Bad grammar, but great theology. If you ever was God, you still is God. Amen? So Jesus was God. 
He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him. Apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life and the light for the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness could not comprehend it. And Jesus, the word, became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Oh, before Jesus ever came to this earth, he was Lord. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or selfishly held on to. Second point. Now, don't get your hopes up that the rest of them are that quick. But anyway, second point. <laughs> this second was a little longer. Look there in your text. Bible says in verse 7, he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant being made in the light. Of the Jesus was Lord before he came to this earth. Jesus was Lord while he was on this earth. While he was on this earth. He was large and in charge. He emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men. The Jehovah Witnesses have it all wrong. They say that Jesus is just the Son of God, but he's not God the Son. Listen to me, he's both. The Mormons have it wrong. They say, oh, we men can become gods. Look at me. That's not Christianity. Christianity is not about a man becoming a god. Christianity is about God becoming a man. The God-man, Jesus Christ. And so Jesus was Lord while he was on this earth. I, I want to give you a little assignment. You say, this is church. This isn't school. Well, you're supposed to learn something, aren't you? And I want to give you some homework. Here it is. Go home and just read the last part of Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 35. And then read all the way through chapter 5. It won't take you five minutes. And here's what you'll find, that while he was on the earth... Jesus was Lord. He was Lord, first of all, over disaster. You remember in Mark chapter 4, Jesus said, let's get into the boat. Let's go to the other side. Now, if they just listened, they never would have worried about the storm. He already promised them they're going to make it to the other side. And I'm telling you, look at me. Have you been saved? He's going to get you to the other side, all right? I don't care what storm you got to go through. He's getting you to the other side. He's already said he's going to get you to the other side. He said, let's go to the other side. They got out there. I'll be on the Sea of Galilee in about a week. We'll go out there and the boat's small boat. Jesus is asleep at the back of the boat and the water starts to get in the boat. How many of you know that it's bad when the water gets into the boat? Amen. I mean, you want the boat in the water. You don't want the water in the boat. And so they do everything they can. And finally they do something that you and I have done many times. Lord, don't you care? Wake up, Lord. You ever talked like that to God? You ever said, Lord, are you there? Hello? Don't you care that we're perishing? And Jesus, I love it. He stands up, looks out the looks out at the at the wind, and said, "Hush." And he looks at the water and said, "Be still." How many of you have quoted that? You parents on a vacation while you're driving, anybody? Anybody ever quoted that verse? Man, when I had teenagers, that was my life's verse. Amen. I'm telling you. Hush. Be still. And it had no option. It stopped. Why? Because while he was on this earth, Jesus was Lord over disaster. And he still is. And then he gets to the shore and two naked men running down the hill after him. Out, they just jumped out of a tomb and they're running down the hill naked. And one of them is prominent and he's got a chain dang on. And you know what, you know what the, the disciples did? They say, Jesus, this one's yours. <laughs> Kind of like some deacons I've met over the years. Pastor, we're praying for you. Go get him. All right. I love you guys, deacon. My dad was a deacon, so I'm not mad at you. Jesus, I know Jesus got out of the boat by himself because he's the only one that talked to the guy. And the guy falls down the ground, and Jesus was rebuking the devil. And he said, come out of him. What is your name? And the demon said, my name is Legion, for there are many. Notice. The devil has an army. It is organized. It is violent. It will take you down if you don't have Jesus. And Jesus cast it out in the swine. I've been to the place where that took place. And the Bible says the swine 
ran into the Sea of Galilee and they drowned. How could he do that? He was Lord over disaster, but while he was on this earth, Jesus was Lord over the devil and demons. Amen. Now, they didn't like it. They didn't like all their, you know, a lot of these were Gentiles. They didn't like their pigs getting drowned and all that. So they told Jesus to leave. Let me just tell you something about Jesus. Jesus only goes where he's invited, only stays where he's welcome. So he said, you don't welcome me? Okay, I'm gone. And so he starts leaving. And a guy named Jairus comes up and said, hey, my little girl, my little 12-year-old girl, she's about to die. Will you come help me? He said, let's go. Jesus goes where he's invited. And on the way, the crowd is pressing in on Jesus. I mean, they wanted to touch him. They just wanted to be around him. They knew that power was coming out of this guy. And they said, we want Jesus. And so they're, they're pushing and they're pushing. And they're trying to walk through the crowds. And all of a sudden, a lady who had a hemorrhage for 12 years, she had had the hemorrhage exactly the same time that that little girl of Jairus had lived. 12 years. And so she pushes through. She's hurting but she's not going to let anybody keep her from Jesus. And I can see her in pain, lunge, and all she can grab is the hem of his garment. But she grabbed his garment with the hand of faith. And that was the garment of grace. And when faith and grace get together, good things happen. Amen? And so she grabs that garment and the Bible says virtue came out of him and flowed and she was healed just like that. He said, well, I don't believe that. So? It happened. You say, how do you know? It's in the Bible. So it happened. And Jesus knew that virtue had flown up, come out of him. That's right after, right after that whole legion of demons had been cast out. This little girl gets healed, or, 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 or this woman gets healed, rather. And Jesus looks at her and said, your faith has made you whole. Don't, don't, don't worry, your faith has made you whole. How could he do that? He was Lord over disaster. He was Lord over the devil and demons. He was Lord over disease. He gets to Jairus' house, and the mourners come out and they say, why trouble the teacher anymore? The little girl's dead. People can be cruel. And Jesus looked and said, hey, don't pay attention to them. Only believe. Only believe. It's going to be all right. And he cast everybody out. Sometimes you've got to get people out of the room before God can move. Amen? Oh, did I say that? I did. Sometimes some people got to get out of the way. God's got to move people out of the way. Jesus got to get somebody out of the way that doesn't believe or is hindering the work of God. And he got those people that didn't believe. And he took those three disciples he knew it could depend on. And he walks in there with Peter, James, and John and Jairus and his, his wife. And there's a cold, dead little 12-year-old body. And he says to her, Talitha Kumai, little girl get up. And you know what? She didn't have an option. Amen. She had to get up and she got up and she was hungry. And somebody said, I don't understand that. Then you don't understand kids. Amen. I'm telling you, they wake up hungry. Amen. And she, she ate some and Jesus said, now don't tell anybody. Now how in the world could he do that? Aren't you glad he wasn't just Lord over disaster? He wasn't just Lord over the demons of the devil. He wasn't just Lord over disease. Praise God, he is Lord over death. Amen? Lord over death. Give him praise. Give him praise right now. Amen. Amen. So Jesus was Lord before he came to earth. And he's Lord while he's on this earth. But there's a third thing Paul writes about. In Philippians, Jesus was Lord while he was on the cross. Look at verse 8. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Everybody say he humbled himself. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. It's just like Max said, the cross was not an afterthought. The cross is why he came. 
obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. I'm telling you, while Jesus was on that cross, he was in charge. They nail him to the cross. They're on Calvary's hill. And he starts praying for the ones that were driving the nails and all the Jews down there that were mocking him. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Guess what? We still don't know what we're doing. Oh, he prayed for his enemies. He, Jesus will never ask you to do something that he wasn't willing to do. Jesus prayed for his enemies. And then the Bible says his mother was over there watching. Don't you love Mary? Now, we don't pray to Mary. And Mary had other children besides Jesus. I won't go off into all that. But I love her. She's right there, buddy. She's staying there with you. I tell you, your mom will stay with you. Amen? Your mom will stay with you. And John's right there with the disciple he loved. And he took care of his mom. I, got, I had the privilege of taking care of my mom after she had a stroke. I took care of her for several years. And it was a privilege. She took care of me. When I couldn't take care of me, I took care of her. When she couldn't take care of herself. And the Bible says Jesus took care of his mom. He said, woman... And that, that wasn't a bad thing. It was, it was, that was a polite way of saying, woman, that's your new son. Man, that's your new wife. And John took care of her, and they were both eventually buried at Ephesus after the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. Way after that, John would write the, the Gospel of John and also his other writings in about 90 AD. And Mary died before that, but they were... They were eventually taken away from there, but they were originally buried at Ephesus. Why did Jesus do that? Because he was Lord while he was on the cross. And then the Bible says these uh, two guys on either side, they start cursing at him. But then one of them sees that what he's doing is wrong, comes under conviction, prays the lousiest sinner's prayer you've ever heard in your life. How many of you know that it's not what comes out of your mouth, it's what's in your heart? Amen. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He said, hey, I'll do better than that today. You're going to be with me in paradise. Amen. Isn't that something? Jesus walked back to the Father in the spirit that day and said, hey, hey Father, I brought one with me. <laughs> That's the guy on the cross. That old boy just barely got in. Amen. You talking about the skin of your teeth? Don't you know he, he was like Gomer Pyle? Shazam, man. Just looking around. <laughs> wow. This is awesome. How could he do that? He was Lord while he was on the cross. And then the Bible says it became midnight at midday. It got dark for three hours. And the Son of God, who knew no sin, bore our sin in his body on the cross. And he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Herschel Hobbes said he was momentarily forsaken of God so that you and I would not be eternally forsaken of God in hell. God laid the iniquity of us all upon Jesus and he died. And at the end he said, I'm thirsty. He wasn't being selfish, but he had something he wanted to shout that everybody in heaven, everybody on earth and everybody on Calvary's hill and everybody in hell could hear, including the devil. He had one word to shout. In English, it's three words, but in the Greek, it's one. And he cried out, Tetelestai, paid in full. It is finished. He paid for every sin you've ever committed, every sin I've ever committed, every sin ever to be committed. He drank the dreg of the cup of the wrath of God, turned over the chalice and said, it's done. It's paid. It's paid in full. It is finished. Give God praise that it's finished. And then he said, all right. Now, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. You look at me. The devil wasn't in charge. The Jews weren't in charge. The Romans weren't in charge. Jesus 
was Lord while he was on that cross. He was Lord before he ever came to this earth, Lord while he was on this earth, Lord while he was on the cross, and then they buried him. And it used to bother me, Pastor, that they buried him in a borrowed tomb. But then I thought, he's only going to be there three days. <laughs> Why buy? <laughs> Why rent? Just borrow. He didn't even leave a mess. He folded his clothes. <laughs> he made his bed, amen? And aren't you glad on that Third day he rose bodily, victoriously, and eternally from the grave. Amen. Give God praise. He's, Jesus is alive. Amen. Amen. Hey, look at me. Look at me. Do you realize that every other hero of every other holy book is as dead as a hammer? Muhammad's dead. Buddha's dead. Jesus is alive. He's alive. He's alive. <laughs> Don't ever get tired of that. He's in this room. We've gathered in his name. That's why I came. I didn't just come to, I love all y'all. Praise God. I'm glad you're here, but I want Jesus here. Amen. He appears to his disciples for 40 days, goes back, sends the Holy Ghost. That's how I know it's, it's uh, five days to heaven and five days back. Amen. He was gone 10 days. Holy Ghost came back. If you didn't get that, ask your neighbor. They didn't get it either. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's getting late. The Spirit of God came back. Jesus is in heaven. Mac talked about Psalm 110, verse 1. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. The Father said, I want you to stay here until I make all your enemies a footstool for his feet. And he's also preparing heaven. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again, receive you unto myself. Jesus is preparing heaven. The carpenter of Nazareth is the builder of heaven. Heaven's going to be awesome. And then he's pardoning lost people. But he's also getting ready to come back, which leads me to my last thing. Jesus was Lord before he came to earth. Jesus was Lord while he was on this earth. He was Lord over disaster. He was Lord over demons and the devil. He was Lord over disease and he was Lord over death while he was on this earth. And while he was on the cross, Jesus Christ was Lord because he came out of the grave with the keys in his hand. I like to be around the guys that got keys, don't you? Because you can just pretty much get anywhere you want to. Jesus said, I'm coming out of that grave and you're not gonna lock me in anymore. Because I got the keys. I got the keys to the grave. I got the keys. I had a man was two days away from dying, called me in about two years ago, and he said, Preacher, he said, and he was, boy, I mean, he'd had chemo. He was so shriveled up. He said, and I'm, I'm, I'm telling you what he said. He said, Brother Steve, he said, I, I'm, not, I'm not afraid to die in the sense of well, I know where I'm going, but I'm afraid to die. Now, listen, he said, because I've never done it. He said, I don't know what's, what it's going to be. And I said, I'm, I want to tell you what I think it's going to be. I want to tell you what I think it's going to be. I think here, here's what death is going to be. And God, God just gave me. It's just one of those, those few times, Brother Mac, you know this, and you do too. That God just gives you something. I said, when I was a little boy, my dad was a big old, he was in the Navy in World War II, big old railroader. And I was always afraid of going into our house. We never used the front door. You know why? It went into the living room and we never lived in the living room. <laughs> Anybody ever have a living room like that? It was real nice, too nice to go in. I don't know why we call it the living room. Why don't we just call it the looking room? We never look, lived in it. We just looked at it, all right? And so we never went to the front door. We always went to the back door and it's always dark and I didn't want to go in. And so my big old 200 and something pound daddy would walk in there and he'd open the door. He'd put, get the key, open it up, open it up. Go ahead, turn the light on me, on for me. And he'd turn around and he'd say, Steve, come on in. Everything's fine. I said, Mark, do you know what Jesus did for you when he went in the grave? He turned the light on. He opened the door. And now he's looking at you and saying, hey, Mark, come on in. Everything's fine. I'm Lord over the grave. Don't worry about it. I got the keys. I got the keys. Aren't you glad Jesus has the keys to the grave and we don't have to fear death? Amen. So 
Lord before he came to this earth, Lord while he's on this earth, Lord while he's on the cross, but he's going to be Lord when he comes back. Amen? And that's how Paul ends this first century hymn. Therefore, verse 9, for this reason God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of those who are in heaven those on the earth those under the earth every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father I believe in the rapture I'm, I'm with, with Mac and I guess your pastor too I believe that at any moment Christ could come back in the rapture then the great tribulation the rapture is when he comes for his saints and then the great tribulation on this earth the worst time of this earth will ever be. And then we're going to be up in heaven celebrating at the Lamb's Supper with the Lord Jesus. But the Bible then says we're going to come back with him and we're going to be on white horses. I don't even like horses, but I'm going to be with, on a horse that day. Amen. And you will too. And we're coming back with Jesus, second coming of Jesus. And here's what it sounds like. And I saw heaven open. And behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in, in righteousness, he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire. On his head are many diadems. His name written on him, uh, and his na has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, that's us, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may smite the nations and strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's going to be Lord when he comes back. Give him praise right now. Don't only give him praise. Amen. And every, look at me, every eye will see and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What's going to happen in Iran? I don't know, but Jesus is Lord. Who's going to be the next president? I don't know, but Jesus is Lord. What's the economy going to do? I don't know, but Jesus is Lord. What's going to happen to my health? I don't know, but Jesus is Lord. What's going to happen to America? I don't know, but look at me. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. I preach myself happy. Amen. <laughs> Let's stand up. I stand up. You know this old song? Sing it with me. He is Lord. He is Lord. He has risen from the dead and he is Lord. Every knee. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now sing it to him. You are Lord. You are Lord. It's okay to lift a hand if you want to. You are Lord. You have risen. You have risen from the dead and you are Lord. Every knee, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now let me ask you a question. Is he your Lord? Is he your Lord? He can be all these other things, but is he your Lord? Have you ever tasted and seen that the what? The Lord is good. He's good. How many of you know he's good? Amen. He's good. He's better than anything out there. He's better than anything you could drink, anything you could eat, any person you could be with, any money you could have, any job you could have, any career you could have, any hope you could have, anything out there is nothing compared to Jesus. Jesus is good and he is Lord. If you don't know him, 
You can't even fathom how much he loves you. You can't even fathom how much he wants to change your life. He loves you too much, though, to run you over. He's going to let you. He gave you something called choice. He gave you something called will. And even though your will has been tainted by a sinful nature, you still have the capacity to come to him and to humble yourself and to repent of your sin and turn from your sin. That's what repent means. Do a U-turn with the help of the Holy Ghost. Do a, a spiritual 180, all right? And you say, I'm sick of living for myself. I'm sick of living just on my own. I want Jesus in my life. And you give your life and you repent of your sin. And then you put all of your faith in him. You say, I believe that Jesus died for my sins, not just for everybody's, but for my sins. And I believe he rose from the dead. I believe he's alive. And so you repent and you believe. And there's one more thing you receive. You invite him to come into your life. Just like a young couple receives each other at their wedding vows at the altar. That's when they get married. Not when the preacher says something over them, but when they say their vows to one another. And when you come to Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, I surrender. I give you my life. Oh, Jesus, I call upon the name of the Lord. Isn't that what he say? Call upon the name. Of, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Say it out loud. Say. You can do that. It's there for you. He offers you a gift, but you got to reach out and take it. By grace, through faith in Christ, you've got to repent, believe, and receive. RBR. Repent, believe, receive. Say it with me. Repent, believe, receive. Say it one more time. Repent, believe, receive. You do that. That's your part. His part is, I will save you. I will change you. I'll change you. I'll change the way you think. I'll change the way you act. I'll change the way you talk. I'll change the places you go. I'll change your whole life. I'll change your friendships. I'll change your family. I'll change everything about you. I'll turn you inside out and I'll live through you the rest of my life, of your life. And then one of these days I'll take you up and you'll be absent from the body and present with me and will be forever. And you'll just be able to worship me and say, you're Lord, you're Lord, you're Lord. And I'll say, you're my child, you're my child, you're my child. And it's going to be awesome. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Don't you want that? I want our pastors to come very quickly and just stand here. And we're going to sing. I don't know what song we're going to sing, but I'll know you'll know it. Don't worry about that. And you just sing and worship the Lord. And while we're doing this, if there's anybody here tonight that doesn't know Jesus, please come and give your heart to Christ. Repent it your sins, believe in Jesus and receive him as Lord and Savior. And then tonight, maybe you're a Christian and you say, I'm just not living for the Lord. Man, now look at me. Hey, look at me. The world is going public for not living for the Lord. It is time for Christians to go public living for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So why don't you come up here and recommit your life? to the Lord. If you've never been baptized, come and set up a time to get baptized. If you want to join a church like, I'm thinking about moving my membership. Amen. I'm telling you, this is a good church. So just come and say, I want to be part of this church. I want to be part of Mims Baptist Church. I want to be part of a church that believes in having a Bible conference and worshiping and it's nine o'clock at night and we don't care. You know why? Because Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Why don't you be part of a church like that? I mean, there's very few churches that would have this many people on a Wednesday night. You, if you're being fed here, you're probably being led here. Why don't you come and join this church? And if you just want to come to the altar and pray and say, oh God, in these last days, in these days of darkness, let the Lordship of Christ be real. I don't know what God's doing in your life, but let's just have about four or five minutes if we can of where we do business with God, all right? I'm going to pray. We're going to sing. And those of you who need to come, come. Some of you deacons might want to come. You know what? You're a leader in the church. You know what leaders do? They lead. Maybe you should come and pray. Oh, God, pour out your spirit upon our nation. Some of you teachers out there, why don't you lead? Some of you daddies out there. Some of you husbands out there. Some of you staff members out there. Why don't you lead? Leaders lead. Why don't you come to the altar and say, oh, God, pour out your spirit upon them. Be the Lord over the United States of America. Father, in the name of Jesus, whatever it is you want, that's what we want. Father, I pray in the sovereign name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you would be Lord over this invitation and Lord over this entire week, but Lord over this service right now. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said,
Amen. Let's sing. You come.